They say there can only be one. But what happens if we make another one? I don't know what that means. But we're about to remake Highlander right. <laughs> Hello, my fellow cinematic architects, and welcome to Remake This Movie Right. If you are a member of the Hollywood Outsider Network, listen to episodes of Remake This Movie Right on Apple Podcasts. Reviews are appreciated. Your podcast app of choice, or just visit the website at RemakeThisMovieRight.com. Also Spotify, if you're on Spotify. Remake This Movie Right is a show that takes an original film that has an actual remake in the works, generally, figure out what still clicks and what doesn't, throws a little bit of humor at it, and then we determine exactly how Hollywood should remake it. So by the end of each episode, we will have the remake ready to roll for Hollywood execs and presented to you in movie trailer form. We are here to tell Hollywood how to remake this movie right. I'm your host, Darren Peterson, and joining me today, you might remember her from our Heather, Splash, and Wow Wow West episodes, Angela Wallach. Wicka wicka! <laughs> hey guys. You brought it back? I brought it back. <laughs> nice. It's it's just a part of me now. It is a part of you. And you might have heard him on the Hollywood Outsider from time to time. He goes by Scotch on occasion, but here he goes by Scott. Making his first appearance on Remake His Movie Right, Scott Calgaro. There can be only one. Oh. Scotch Calgaro. <laughs> so for this <laughs> this episode, we are remaking Highlander. And a lot of people in your lifetime, you've probably heard make the saying like Scott, Scott just did. There can be only one. And this is the movie that it's from. So now you know. And I... It's on Hulu. We watched it on Hulu. I believe it's on Amazon Prime. You can go mm-hmm. out and partake in this glorious cinematic feast again if you choose. But before we get to it, we got to talk about what this movie is about. I'm still not sure, but this is what the synopsis says. <laughs> Based on the story by George Wyden, Highlander starts in New York. The owner of a sophisticated antique shop, Russell Edwin Nash, is challenged to a sword fight in a parking garage at Madison Square Gardens by a man named Imin Fassel. That uh, that is immediately kind of beheaded by Russell. He hides his sword and he's arrested by the police while he's leaving the stadium. Russell then recalls his life in the 16th century in Scotland where he is Connor McLeod. McLeod or McLeod? McLeod. Okay. Well, it reads McLeod. It's because you're not Scottish. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm not Scottish. Uh, Connor McLeod. Who is that accent. I. You know what? It's better than Sean Connery's. I can promise you that. Yeah, that's true. Russell, um, okay, so, and he's fatally wounded in a battle against another clan. However, he surprisingly survives, and his clan believes he has a, made a pact with a devil and expels him from their lands. Then he meets <laughs> Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez, who, dis- who explains that he is immortal unless he is beheaded. I'm laughing because it's Sean Connery who does not look Spanish at all. Nope. Further, mm-hmm. the immortals uh, dispute a game, killing each other, and in the end, only one can survive, receiving a prize with the power of the other immortals. So basically, if you kill and you're only the only one left, you you become the Highlander, right? Essentially, uh, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think that's what the plot was. <laughs> so Russell's released by the police, but there's a forensic agent named Brenda J. Wyatt who's uh, attracted by the case, and she found fragments of an ancient katana and follows Russell. They get involved, of course. They have a little bit of '80s. Intercourse. Skinematic sex. Yes. There's skinematic sex. I forgot that was in there until I rewatched it. There was there was a prominent nipple. <laughs> it, it was like silhouetted nipples. Yeah. I was like, no silhouetted nipples in my remake. Nope. <laughs> oh, well, we're going to have to make a cut on that one. But the, other, <laughs> the also immortal Kurgan is on the hunt to take Connor out because there can be only one. And he's played by Clancy Brown. Mr. Given- Krabs. Giving the most overacting, but yet fantastic <laughs> depiction of a villain I've seen in a long time. All right. So <laughs> initial thoughts on this one, memory memories on this one. Scott, you've never done this before. What are yours? And I want to say your initial thoughts versus rewatching thoughts. The very first time I watched this movie, I was completely lost. In fact, I turned it off. I, did, I wasn't able to track, and I was young when I first saw this. I wasn't able to track the bouncing back and forth in time. I got totally confused by that, and I just was like, this movie sucks, and I turned it off. I watched it probably a year or two after that. Somebody was really talking it up, and I'm a big sword guy. I love sword fighting, love sword fighting movies. I collect swords from overseas. And I'm like, all right, it's got the sword fighting thing. I missed that the first time. I'll give it another try. And I actually really loved it. Once I understood what was going on, this became one of my all-time favorite movies. That said, this movie does not hold up. <laughs> I just watched it two days ago on Amazon Prime, and I was cringing at how bad parts of this movie. 
But I, I still love it. I mean, I love the concept of it. I love the storyline. I think it's great. But the movie definitely, definitely ready for a remake. Well, you got to hold it up to, to the test of time. I mean, when it came out in the 80s, it probably looked a hell of a lot better than it does currently. Yeah. Plus, I was younger and less critical about movies and just was all into the whole action thing. Less, less jaded. Yeah. But it's just it just doesn't hold up now. It, it needs a complete modern reboot. What about you, Angela? Um, actually, funny enough... Uh, the reason why I watched Highlander and I actually remember watching Highlander. I watched all of the Highlander movies and I watched the TV show was because my mother is the biggest fan. My mom loves the Highlander series, which if you met my mother, it's pretty ridiculous that that she loves the Highlander movie series because it's, you know, not really geared towards middle-aged moms, (laughs) but for whatever reason, my mom really dug it. I, just kind of weird so my memories are really watching it with my mom and like I said we really liked it so much so that we were big fans of the tv series like I watched the whole tv series starring Adrian Paul did you really Duncan McLeod yeah (laughs) heck yeah I did this is a great time to bring that up the series was better than the movies I thought it, it was. I was a big was. fan of – a much bigger fan of Duncan McLeod than I was of Connor. I thought that Adrian Paul did a great job on that oh, series. Christopher Lum- Lumbert is very upset right now. Uh, <laughs> fine. He earned it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, Duncan McLeod was really great. And, well, the big thing for me, and, I mean, we'll discuss this, is that I feel like the movie misses, like, the whole middle section. Like, there's just – there's so many unanswered and, like – unanswered questions, unanswered scenes. And I feel like the TV series got to dig into that. So you got to understand more of like the highlight, the well, the immortal lore and things like that. So, but anyways, I enjoyed it. I am in the same boat. It does not hold up well at all. Mm -mm. Excuse me. But it was good. And it was good in 86. Yeah. (laughs) You want to know what's funny? When I watched it, in 1986, I was high on Sean Connery. Like everything with Sean Connery was was awesome at that point. Mm-hmm. I even thought he was awesome here. Now I rewatched it. I'm like, it's kind of offensive. I think I don't. Oh I don't, yeah, it's pretty terrible. I don't yeah. know what to think. But he's Sean Connery, so he's cool enough. Where you're like, yeah, that's the Spanish accent. Sure, I could buy that, even though it's totally Scottish, 100. percent Well, he's Egyptian, oh, yeah. by the way. Did you know that? What his character Ramirez is actually Egyptian. He lived in Spain, but he was born in Egypt. Both of yeah, those I are wrong. That. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't, he, he didn't, he didn't right. hit either one of them. Yeah. Mm. No. I guess he hung no. out with Sean Connery a lot to get that accent. <laughs> I guess. I know. The irony is that Christopher Lambert, who's French, does not do a good Scottish accent, but he's supposed to be Scottish. And you got Sean Connery, who is Scottish, supposed to be like a Spaniard and does his just his normal standard Scottish accent. Well, the so. ir- the irony there is that Connery – Actually, is it Lam- Lambert or Lambert? I, cause it's, it's Lambert. I, it, he's French, so in France it's probably Lambert, but I've always heard it pronounced in the United States as Lambert, Christopher Lambert. You know what? I'm going to throw some flair on it. It's going to be Lambert for me. <laughs> I, I liked him. He did a movie. Oui, oui. I liked him quite a bit. He was like a fun guy to watch in, in the 80s. Him, He did Fortress and he did uh, Tarzan. He was great in Tarzan. Yeah. I yeah, thought he I was like awesome in Tarzan. Yeah, I always thought he was a fun guy to watch. But – this movie, I remember when I saw it the first time. I watched it because of my, <coughs> Sean, my Sean. I watched it because of my Sean Connery kick, and it hit it hit that sweet spot. I mean, it was a, a cool movie to watch. It had a different concept. It was, but I never understood what the hell the concept was. Rewatching it, I still don't. I'm still not 100 percent certain what the point of the movie is completely. Because if it was in any other time but modern days, I think this movie works better. But the fact that it's in modern days and they're whipping out swords. That's going to bring attention at some point. I mean, a lot more attention than he got, I felt like. I feel like I feel like there'd be a bulletin or something. <laughs> hey, guys running around having sword fights in parking garages. Look out. Let us know if you see this. Feels like it would stand up. Well, they brought that into the series, which, by the way, I hated the whole cop story. When I rewatched yeah, it, that was hard to watch because, first of all, those were – horrific stereotypes of 1980s New York police officers. They, it was just painful to watch, especially if you used to be a cop like me. They yeah. were just awful. But they they did bring that up. You, you know? mean cops don't punch people in the interrogation room? No. That's not bad. if they want to stay cops. Really disappointed and in that. A whole bunch of other stuff that I won't get into. Those cops <laughs> were just, just awful. But they did bring up the fact that these beheaded corpses turn up. So that did actually come out. No, I, it's the swords that cracked me up. Because where are you people? He just... Pulls one out in the in the parking garage of his car. I'm like, 
How do you hide that? How do you? <laughs> well, he's always wearing a trench coat. <laughs> yeah, but it's a sword. It's you can not conceal a, a katana. They didn't have metal detectors. You didn't get oh pet down. You, you can conceal a it. katana. You can't. That, that giant thing was sword bigger that the Gurgan had. It was yeah. so much bigger than him. And he's just like, <laughs> he's pulling it out. It's like a magic trick. I'm waiting for the snake to end. I'm like, where's this? Where's the pointy end? Because it just keeps pulling out sword. It was very uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable. <laughs> Now we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of it. Please subscribe and review us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. If you have your own pitch or thoughts on this week's show, you can always email them to remake this movie right at gmail.com, or you can go on Facebook and find the Remake This Movie Right group and put your thoughts in there. Here's a clip from the original Highlander. You're an antique dealer, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. What's that? A sword? Wise up, smartass. It's a Toledo Salamanca broadsword worth about a million bucks. So? So you want to hear a theory? Mm Mm-hmm. You went down that garage to buy this sword from that guy. What's his name? I don't know. You tell me. Okay. His name is Amon Fazil. And you fought about the price and cut off his head. Want to hear another theory? This Fazil was so upset about lousy wrestling tonight. He went down to the garage and in a fit of depression cut off his own head. That's not funny, Walt. Okay, before we get into everything, we got some trivia. You guys ready for some Highlander trivia? It's me, of Bring course. It. <laughs> Sean Connery and Christopher Lambert got along so well during filming that they called each other by their characters' names, even when they were not filming. And it was at Lambert's insistence that Connery and his character returned for Highlander 2, The Quickening. Hmm. Hope we got a fat check for that. Yeah. Because that movie sucked. That movie sucked. was awful. Yeah. <laughs> that was, this one, at least I could see why I dug it as a kid, but I, the second one's awful. The original voiceover by Sean Connery has an echo effect because it was recorded in the bathroom of his Spanish villa where he had been working with a voice coach in order to perfect the Spanish accent he used in the film. It was played for the producers over the phone and they approved of it because they could not discern the quality of the recording that way. I just want to go back to he was working with a voice coach to perfect <laughs> his Spanish accent. That he does not have at all. No, there isn't one. I got to fire that guy. Let's go yeah. back in time and fire that guy. I think he was just working with himself. And he was like, just <laughs> had a mirror and he found a way to get paid twice. Um, all of Sean Connery's scenes had to be filmed in a week due to Connery's schedule. He had a bet with director Russell Mulcahy that they could not finish in seven days. But Mulcahy won the bet. Connery earned a million bucks for his week's work. Wow. I wish I made a million dollars a week. And $86, man. Yeah. That's like a billion. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, According to director Russell McCahey, when they first shot the scene of the Kurgan bursting through a door to cut the table in half, Clancy Brown instead ran in and cut through the candelabra, nearly decapitating Sean Connery. As a result, Connery stormed off the set. Later, Connery returned and Brown apologized, saying he was very nervous. Connery joked that he should use his stunt double more. That could have been an awesome scene if it had gone the other way. If he cut his head off? Well, I mean, it would have been real. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> it's a movie about decapitations. It works. Yeah, that does. They just I'm sure they'd air that footage, right? This is that scene <laughs> where he killed Sean Connery, the actor. Here's my personal favorite bit of trivia. Kurt Russell was originally cast as Connor McLeod. Oh, I knew you were going to love that when oh, I saw yeah. it. But he pulled out of the project at the insistence of his girlfriend, Goldie Hawn. He instead starred in Big Trouble in Little China. And I do want to add, we're all thankful for that. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yeah. we are. And at one point, Mark Singer from V, uh, we did an episode about V not too long ago, was the top choice for the role of Connor McLeod, but he turned it down to scheduling conflicts. So a lot of people were turning this down, but Christopher Lambert was all about it. Sweet. Yeah. He learned, I mean, it worked. Learned how to speak mm-hmm. English. All right. Clancy Brown almost turned down the role of the Kurgan uh, because it required prosthetics. He had experienced an allergic reaction to a prosthetic glue. He had just finished portraying Frankenstein's monster in The Bride. And production had to be shut down for three weeks because of his severe allergies. Clancy Brown also originally wanted the Kurgan to be dressed in a suit and bowler hat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to mentally picture that right now, and it's in parts awesome and horrifying. I, I would kind of watch ridiculous. the hell out of that, though. I really would. Uh, just for fun fact, the quickening is a term for when a baby in the womb shows its first sign of life, its first noticeable movement within the womb. So I don't know what connection that has, but that's what I went with. Whatever. Yeah. Hmm. I did not know that. Yeah. Any Anything else you guys found that was pretty interesting? 
the reason that Christopher Lambert's lines sound so stilted and not well acted is because he had to learn English to do this movie. He did not speak English at all before he took this role. So all that English is either just memorized or he learned English really fast. But that's why he sounds so not great when he gives his lines because he doesn't really probably understand what he's saying. (laughs) Interesting. That is interesting. All right, let's get into the original. So, uh, Angela, what makes this movie so notable for you? Is What does still work? Okay. Funny enough, some of the stuff that works for me also doesn't work for me, but I'll get to that. So, <laughs> but the stuff that works for me, obviously the premise is really cool. Mm-hmm. How cool is it that there's immortals fighting, only one can survive, there's the ultimate prize. And I think the ultimate prize in the, in the movie is actually, they don't know this, but it's mortality. Because like, that's the whole thing at the end, he's back to being immortal, correct? Yes, you're correct. Yes. Not only is it so, mortality, but it's like universal knowledge. You become almost like omnipotent, apparently. Yeah, you can sense what everybody's sen- feeling or thinking or whatever. So it's right. kind of interesting. I, th- anyways, the premise is really cool. The soundtrack, that's definitely one of my favorites. Obviously, Queen did the entire soundtrack for this, which is really rad. My favorite song is obviously Who Wants to Live Forever. I... Every time I hear that song to this day, I still cry. I don't know why. It's probably because of what happened to Freddie Mercury in the long run, but still it makes me really sad. So the music is awesome. Clancy Brown. I absolutely love Clancy Brown. You're absolutely right that he's over the top ridiculous, Mm -hmm. but for some reason it works in this movie and he's at least fully committed. Like Clancy Brown went. 110% 110% Clancy Brown on this movie. So <laughs> he, he Clancy as, as much as one man can Clancy. <laughs> I know. I'm going to refer to that now when anybody goes over the top, it's a Clancy. Um, there you, go. you Clancy then, the hell out of that, man. <laughs> he Clancy the hell out of it. They're on my, what works, but they're also my, what doesn't work, which I'll get to, but it's Sean Connery and Christopher Lambert. They are, I mean, it's ridiculous. The, the lack of accents, the, that. Sean Connery's character, I don't know. I just rewatched it again this morning because I had rewatched it a couple of weeks ago with my husband who watched it for the very first time. So that was kind of a fun oh. thing to do. But his costume, if you've noticed, Sean Connery has like a cod piece on the outside of his costume. And I was completely distracted by that today. <laughs> yes. It was so weird. <laughs> I was like, Did you keep rewinding it? Was it better than the Skinamax <laughs> shot? For me, it was. <laughs> I'd rather watch the cod piece than silhouetted nipples, but That's fair. it was, it was really good. And then Christopher Lambert. Yeah. For the fact that, yeah, his dialogue is terrible. It's really just choppy and not very, he doesn't emote very well, but there's still something really like unique and interesting about Christopher Lambert. And even when he's like making like the little jokes and things like, I don't know, it's something about, he's got really expressive eyes or something about him. So yeah, he's not the best actor. The The movie's not great. But at the time, those are the things that I did like about the movie. You guys say he's not, I, I like Christopher Lambert a lot. I like it. And I'm still going Lambert. I don't care everybody else. Saw him. <laughs> uh, I, I I really enjoy him quite a bit. I, I'm i telling you, he, he was just didn't know the language. As he as he learned the language, he was in better movies. And he was in Mortal Kombat. He was cool in that. That movie, Fortress, is a really good movie. It's a very low-budget flick, but uh, that was a really good movie. I like him. Poor, poor Lambert. <laughs> what, what about you? What works for you, Scott? Um, I'm going to agree with you with Christopher Lambert. Uh, he's actually a much better actor than people give him credit for. He was a phenomenal at Tarzan. Yeah, and he was great in that. That came out before this, and he only had like one or two lines, which is why he just memorized mm-hmm. them. He didn't really mm-hmm. know how to speak English. He just memorized his lines. But his physical acting and, like she said, his his facial expressions are really, really – Really good. He's a really good actor. So I did like him in this role. I wish his dialogue had been a little bit more fluid, but again, that's because he didn't know the language. Clancy Brown as the Kurgan is the highlight of this movie for me. I mean, Mr. Krabs did an awesome job of playing just a psychopath on screen, and he put his every all into this movie. He went full Clancy. Yeah, he did. That (laughs) scene where he cuts the table in half, that was an improv by him, by the way. I read that in the trivia. He was just supposed to bust through the door, and he was so into that that he hacked through that table with that sword. He he looked like it. He looked like (laughs) even Sean Connery was like, hey, back up, Jack. (laughs) He was by far my favorite part of this movie. I would watch a standalone Kurgan movie if they could make Clancy Brown young again. I would watch <laughs> Just it now. Just to see where I would that watch goes. watch him do it now. 
It, it, it was awesome. Um, Sean Connery, this is not my favorite role from him. I mean, it, there are parts where he's really into it, and then it also seems like he doesn't understand what he's doing, and he's just kind of phoning it in. He had a lot of those this particular time in his career, though. Yeah, his costume was fabulous. I hadn't noticed the cod piece until I rewatched it, but there's a scene where McLeod calls him a Spanish peacock, <laughs> which I always thought was weird. But if you look at his costume, now you get it. One of his shoulders is peacock feathers. Yeah. Which I had not noticed before that, which I thought was pretty cool. The storyline is great. It was, it's original. You know, mm-hmm. we see too much in Hollywood now that's just not to knock the show, but remakes. It's mm-hmm. taking an, an idea and just redoing it into something else. This was a story that had never been done before. It's a completely unique story that was written just for this movie. And I thought that was brilliant. I still think mm-hmm. it's brilliant. It's a great story. It is. I, I like that they couldn't, it was kind of ironic that immortals couldn't have children as well. I like that. Yes. And, and I love the aspect of when he has to watch his wife get old. Yes. That, that mm-hmm. was really sweet. Actually, that was very smart. They touched on some of the sucky parts of being immortal. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody thinks it'd be great to live forever, but then you get to watch all the people you care about grow old and die. Mm-hmm. That would suck. And they actually brought that really heavy into the story. I really appreciate it. If I was a vampire, I'd dig it though. Because that's a cool life, man. You just get to be handsome and sexy the rest of your life. I'm fine with it. Yeah. Plus with that skin, you hate sunlight. I know. I don't like going out on the beach anyway. So it works out for me. Uh, there were a couple moments I thought were hysterical. There's one, I don't remember, I think it was might have been in the Kurgan where he's like, do as I say, woman, or whoever yes. said that. Mm-hmm. That made me laugh. I'm like, I can't do that anymore. Nope. That's not funny anymore, <laughs> but it's funny then. Uh, and there's another line where he's like in World War II, and he's like, whatever you say, Jack, you're the master race. When he kills that Nazi, I giggled. I hadn't seen that until I watched that cut. That was the first time I'd seen that the the trip to Nazi Germany. Oh, really? Yeah, that's not in the th- theatrical release. That's like a director's cut, and I hadn't seen it until I watched it on Amazon. Oh, it's, a, it's a cool line. I, I thought that was a fun line. Yeah. Like, ah, you're the master race. That's funny. So that, that's my – because you guys already touched on everything else, the, the plot mm-hmm. and everything else. I've got more that doesn't work. Uh, so we're going to jump right into what doesn't work. And I'm starting with Sean Connery, who I love. But he works in the movie – like he's the most engaging character in the entire movie for me. But his accent is just <laughs> – it's – I can't not laugh when people keep calling him Spaniard anything. And I'm like, but really? I mean, he doesn't even try to sound Spanish at all. Like Schwarzenegger could pull off a better Spanish accent than Connery did. And I found that was uh, that was a little You know, little he is, he's Kevin Costner in Robin Hood. He is. He can't. Like, I'm not even going to try. No. <laughs> he's like, I'm Sean Connery. What are you going to do? The other thing that doesn't work for me as much as I like Lambert, Lambert what I don't don't like is whenever he does his little maniacal laugh, he sounds just like Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> it drove me crazy. <laughs> <I> totally <died. laughs> it tro- totally drove me crazy. I'm like, is he channeling Tommy Wiseau before Tommy Wiseau was a thing? Because that's what happened. Ha ha ha. Nice story, Sean. That's what I kept thinking. Maybe picturing. that's where Tommy Wiseau learned his like English is watching Christopher Lambert. God, movies. I hope not. <laughs> he, he grew up watching Christopher Lambert movies. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Now it all makes sense. He's actually from Houston, Texas. And he, <laughs> he just grew up watching a lot of Christopher Lambert movies. Oh, well, like he said he's, he always says he's from New Orleans. So maybe he really is. We've there, been wrong. He watched a ton of Highlander, a ton of there Mortal Kombat, and this is what happened. Yeah, <laughs> I could see it. Oh, man. All right, so what doesn't work for, for you guys? Well, I already mentioned in my intro, the cop thing sucked. Every time they brought those cops into the story, I wanted to shoot my TV. They're Except horrible. Nipple Cop. I was cool with her. The 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 forensic the forensic um too, too tacky Angela I can't tell <laughs> <laughs> the forensic scientist or whatever the hell Brenda is just happens to have written a sword uh, a book on medieval sword making and she's like this expert on swords really yeah she just it, happens to be there for this that bugs as you the crap do, out of me it happens the whole that whole thing just killed me Sean Connery like I said and I wasn't really a big fan of him in this. They could have done better casting with that. I think they put him in the movie because he's Sean Connery and they wanted a big name in the movie. I'm Sean Connery. Right. I'm a Spaniard. Nobody knew who Christopher Lambert was. Certainly nobody knew who Clancy Brown was, not as a big name actor. So they needed a big name to pull people in and they picked Sean Connery, which was, in my opinion, a horrible choice. Wow. Horrible choice. He's well, still having fun throughout the movie. I mean, he's- I, I don't, Maybe horrible choice is too strong. I think they could have done better. I think they could have definitely done better. There's and, probably one or two Spanish guys that were working. <laughs> could, yeah. Could have used the check. Yeah. 
And the special effects, I mean, it was 1986, so we, we've been spoiled by CGI for the last 25 years. But it, yeah. the special effects, especially at the end, are just awful. Mm-hmm. And so is the sword fighting. Could have been a lot better. Mm-hmm. I mean... I thought Michael Bay did it for a minute. I'm like, is it slow motion? Yeah. But the, it's not slow motion. They're just very slow with it. It looks so cool back in the 80s because you yeah, know sword did. fighting really hadn't been done to that point. And you're watching that going, oh, wow, holy crap. Think about some of the lightsaber duels and stuff that we've had in some of the more recent Star Wars movies. This was like watching the original lightsaber duel between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader in the first Star Wars. Yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, I can see that. But, you know, but it was obviously for the time, it was great. It was time, for great the time, for the time it was yeah. great. But man, that definitely needs an update. I watch that now and I'm like, that just doesn't work anymore. The sword fighting is not good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all are pretty much in agreement. Um, my list included the special effects. It It's aged terribly because like, yeah, I get that it was 1986. And so special effects aren't holding up. But if you look at like Star Wars, it still holds up to me. So it's just like. Not everything Star Wars, I know that in most 80s movies, the special effects don't hold up well now. So it's just one of the the problems with this movie. It's just a victim of its time or whatever. So the special effects are terrible. I also wrote down the sword fighting because and that's one of the ones where when I originally when my husband and I were like looking for something to watch and we're like, okay, I said, we should watch Highlander because I saw it and he had never seen it. And I was expecting the sword fighting to be super badass because that's how I remembered it. And it really disappointed me. It was not nearly as cool, just the sword fighting. So, I mean, I knew the special effects were going to be cheesy, but the sword fighting was definitely disappointing. So that's something that could be a lot better. And then uh, my other big issue was that I felt like it really lacks a middle of the story. I, I don't know why it bothers me so much. I guess like the it's like you said, Aaron, like what what is it even about? Sometimes it's hard to kind of figure it out mm-hmm. because you, they introduce like a, an immortal, but then you don't get any backstory of it. And then you don't really see much except for that flashback from, you know, him to Germany. Like what, what the heck did he do all this time? Like I, I want to see some more scenes from his life going from like the 1500s in Scotland to, you know, the 86 in New York City or whatever. So for me, like that's a big letdown that I felt like they just kind of missed out on showing him progressively through the decades or the centuries even. So I, I think that bothers me. And then lastly, like, Sean Connery and Christopher Lambert. Um, I like them, but then I don't like them. Like there's things that, you know, that the accents are, are pretty atrocious and it's pretty much what you guys said. Do you know why you remember the sword fighting better? Why? Because you were a fan of the TV show and it was miles better in the TV show than it was in the movie. That's probably it, because Adrian Paul was badass with that sword. The sword choreography in the series was just light years ahead of what they did in the film. Yeah, I think that's you're you're probably right. That's why I I was like so excited. I'm like, I remember I'm like, Steve, wait, 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 wait for this. And then we watched it and and he thought he was like, oh, it's okay. And I'm like, no, it's so not good. (laughs) That's the way I was when I rewatched it. I texted Aaron. It used to be. Aaron, I told Aaron I was going to watch it. And he's like, let me know if it holds up. And I texted him about 15 minutes later. I'm like, I'm 15 minutes in and I can already tell you this doesn't hold up at all. No, it doesn't. (laughs) Mm -mm. Mm. There's also a line. I just remembered it. Take care of yourself. Don't lose your head. And I was like, oh, my God. My eyes rolled to the back of my skull. I know. Best line in the movie is um, Clancy Brown when the prostitute walks into his room and goes, I'm candy. And he goes, of course you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I was her, wouldn't you turn around and run the hell out? The guys are there like on the, on the floor praying to his giant sword. I, I would leave. That's the time to, to bail. Yep. Yeah. Weird. Okay. Well, should this movie even be remade or should it be placed in don't touch status? I initially, when I heard you were doing this, I was like, oh man, don't mess with this one because I'm remembering it through nostalgia glasses. And then I watched it and I was like, oh, we definitely need to remake this movie because it's awful. This was the listener's pick. This was the number one listener pick for for, uh, being remade. Good choice, listeners, because this one Mm -hmm. definitely needs it. Oh yeah, totally remake. Like the, the premise is awesome. When I watched this, that's all I kept thinking. I was talking to Steve and I was like, we really need to remake this. Like, this is such a good candidate for a remake because the premise is cool. And if you think about what we can do now with special effects, with swordplay, everything, 
with people with real accents. <laughs> it would be so much a better movie. With that, we're going to do one more clip of the Highlander. I don't like boats. I don't like water. I'm a man, not a fish. So you complain and... You look like a woman, you stupid haggis. Haggis? What is haggis? Sheep stomach stuffed with meat and barley. And what do you do with it? You eat it. How revolting. Be still, for God's sake. You'll tip us over. So? I cannot swim, you Spanish peacock. I'm not Spanish. I'm Egyptian. You said you were from Spain. You're a liar. You have the manners of a goat. And you smell like a dung heap. And you have no knowledge whatsoever of your potential. Now. Get out! No! Well, here's what we know about the intended remake. There's really not one in the works. They've talked about it for years, so there's nothing finalized. They're still trying to put the pieces together. Again, since listeners picked this one, that's why we're doing it now, because there's a remake in, in progress. But since Hollywood is eventually going to do it, and we as fans think we know the best way to do this, how should Hollywood remake it? All selections are settled by a best of three votes. So we're going to have this these ideas. We're going to put them together, and we're going to try to find out the best way to go. And anybody that wants to debate it, we can debate it. And if anybody wants to use a cut, they get one cut per episode, which can be used when they're extremely passionate about any idea. And that means we have to go with whatever they want to do. Everybody understand these rules? Yep. Yes, sir. All right, Angela, we're going to let you go first. What What is your idea for a new Highlander? Okay. So you want my pitch? Yeah. My whole give, story? Okay. Give your pitch and we'll basically so, we'll all throw our pitch out and then we'll come back and we'll figure out what the best way to go is. Okay. So my story begins in the 1500s in Scott in the Scottish Highlands because uh, the movie is called Highlander so you need a Highlander so I think that totally is fine so it opens with the clan McLeod they're celebrating Connor's sister's wedding his sister's name is Greer because I named all my characters so Greer's getting <laughs> married so the the family so it's just like a beautiful happy scene nobody's like prepared for battle there's no fights everybody's let like getting a drink on. They're then attacked by a group of Vikings led by the woman named Hildur, who is basically in my story, she's the version of Clancy Brown's character. Um, so her name's Hildur. Uh, so she and her group of Vikings go about killing everybody in the village, or slaughter, 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 kill all of Connor's family. They, she goes to kill Connor's sister and she stabs his sister and Connor is trying to, you know, jump in and stop it. And he also gets stabbed through the heart and he gets pushed off a cliff. You, we shoot down to Connor's body floating down the, the river or whatever. And he wakes up having realized that for some reason he is not dead. And he's obviously distraught because he thinks his whole family and everybody he loves has now been slaughtered. So he actually, because I like this part from the original where Christopher Lambert or Connor McLeod, I should say, tries to kill himself multiple times. Mm -hmm. So I think like that would still be in here. So you'd see him in his desperation and his depression, try to kill himself multiple times and finally realizing like this isn't going to happen for whatever crazy reason I can't die. So he just acclimates to like a normal village life and eventually the Spaniard arrives because you've got to have Ramirez somehow in this story. So the Spaniard arrives and he's trying to approach Connor to explain to him the ways of the immortals. And Connor's like, no, don't talk to me. And eventually, like after some, you know, reluctancy, they establish a relationship and you do get to see the Ramirez kind of teaching Connor what he knows. But in my story, Connor's single at this point in his in the, the story. He doesn't have a wife or anything like that. So and Ramirez encourages Connor to go out and see the world to um, to find other immortals, to learn, to get, you know, to to become a better fighter, because ultimately it's there can be only one. So Ramirez is still living, but they say their goodbyes. Connor leaves and he that's what he does. And in my story, you actually do see Connor traveling the world, you know, going to continent, different continents, Asia, Africa, meeting and fighting immortals. Cause I want you to see him take part in, in the in the TV show they called it the game. I don't remember if they refer to it as the game 
in the movie. Um, but basically the battle, the, the battle between immortals is called, they refer to it as the game. So he's participating in the game over centuries. So he's befriending some immortals that are good, that don't want to kill people, and he's killing immortals. So he's, you know, getting strong through like the quickenings. So that takes place. And then cut to present day New York City, because I, why not? <laughs> or Chicago, you pick the city. Um, and I do like the idea of Connor having a antique shop, which still makes sense to me. And you would, it's kind of cool because now you see where he actually picked up all those antiques ah, from all of his travels across the world over the centuries. So he owns an antique shop and he's actually married. He's happily married. And he's going under an alias and he's just living quietly. And you can gather that he is no longer, you know, trying to kill other immortals or be killed. He just wants to live out his life. His wife does know he's an immortal. So he does tell her. So she is aware of everything. So anyways, they're all happy and everything. And then Hilder shows up into the city trying to track him down. And she eventually is able to find him. And a fight takes place at the antique shop. And in the middle of the fight, his wife gets killed. Mm. Sad. I know. It's sad. So his wife dies. And Hilder escapes. And at this point, Connor is just distraught and doesn't want to live anymore. He's like, I've lived for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. The love of my life just died. And he decides he just wants to die. So he challenges Hilder to a battle just like out in the open and he's not even going to fight. He just wants to go there to die. So he goes there. Hilder's, you know, there and she's about ready to kill him. And then all of a sudden his sister Greer shows up because you find out that Greer was also an immortal. Mm. She has lived this whole time. Greer shows up. They're like shocked to see each other because you find out Greer has been trying to track Hilder to kill Hilder for the revenge for killing her whole family and, you know, her husband. And so Greer and uh, Connor escape and they reunite. And obviously it's like really emotional and Greer tells him they talk about what's happened in their lives or whatever. And they decide that they need to team up to take on Hilder. Eventually they find her Hilder and they go to battle, but they realize while they're doing battle, like Hilder is the strongest, obviously amongst all the immortals because Hilder has killed and killed and killed and killed. And neither Greer or Connor have killed enough people to actually stand really a chance against Hilder. So there's a fight going on and Connor realizes that they're both probably going to die at this point. So he makes Greer behead him so she can take his quickening mm. dun 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 so greer obviously reluctantly but with no choice does behead him um and obviously gets the power of the quickening and then she ends up after like the quickening she's all crazy powerful and everything's you know super lightning and everything's out of control she fights hilder and she's about ready to kill her because she's actually has the strength but because of all of the um, fighting and the quickening and, and everything they've been doing, the building collapses and Hilder escapes. So then the film ends with Greer back in the highlands of Scotland where it all took place. And she's training for a battle. And uh, at the very end, uh, the Ramirez, the Spaniard, shows up. And that's the end. Because I'm setting up sequels. <laughs> <laughs> Got- <clears throat> gotcha. Gotcha. But the spin is... Connor is not like the Highlander we're going to follow in the movies. His sister Greer is. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. All right. That's Angela's pitch. Scott, you or me? You put way more thought into that than I did. Yeah. I went, oh, oh. I just, two things I want to point out. I went really crazy with this. So I chose the name Greer for the sister because Greer in Scottish means vigilant. Mm. So I thought that was kind of cool. And Hilder, the villain, She's a a character in a Norse mythology, and her character revives the dead on the battlefield. That's really cool. That's kind of cool because she obviously can't die. She's an immortal, so I thought that was kind of cool. Look at that. That is kind of cool. More thoughts than they put into their script, let me tell you. Yeah, (laughs) way more. Uh, You can go next if you want. Okay, all right. Well, personally, mine's going to be a lot shorter, but it, <laughs> but you'll see that I, I kind of take it a different way, too. I, personally, I don't want it to be modern day. I would move this entirely to Japanese culture, the age of the samurai, essentially. Connor McLeod has just arrived, and he seeks to train in the way of the great swordsman, 
Following him is the Kurgan, who is a samurai himself. Connor comes across Katsumoto, who knows the story of the Immortals. He's basically Ramirez for this particular movie. And he agrees to train him in the ways of the swordsman, and he knows the entire history of Immortals, etc. The backstory is then told... The, the way that I was envisioning the backstory being told, it's very much like, you guys see Wolverine Origins? I think so. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Well, how they kind of tell... They tell... They tell Logan's story in the opening credits. Oh, that's the one with him and Leif Schreiber, right? Yeah, Leif yeah, I've seen that one. Like, like I know they go from about. different periods of time and they show what he's been doing to get to the period right. that he's at now. Mm-hmm. That's how I would open the movie and tell the backstory in the opening credits that way, so we can get to the current point. I, I just, I just think that would be a, a cool way to do it. It all culminates in, in a brutal battle between Connor and Kurgan, because Kurgan eventually does track him to this Japanese village, and in the end. We come to find out that Connor actually killed Kurgan's family to get to him because he wanted the power. So he, this entire time, he has not been the good guy. He's just been trying to find a way to kill Kurgan so he can take the power. And Kurgan has been after him for revenge. So this is his revenge to kill Connor. Katsumoto learns this and is stunned. And then Kurgan ultimately, he helps Kurgan ultimately kill Connor, which he then becomes the Highlander. So we spend the entire movie believing that Connor is the hero, only to learn late during the final battle that Kurgan is the actual hero of the piece. And by the end, he has the power of the Highlander. That's actually cool. I like flipping that around and turning Kurgan into the good guy Yeah. at the very end. I think that's interesting. Thank you. Well done, sir. Thank you. Right. <laughs> it's a lot shorter than Angela's, but I mean. Hey. And I named him Kurgan because that's what they named the other guy in the first movie. And I named him Connor because that's what they named the <laughs> guy in the first movie. So. All right, you're up, Scott. Uh, I'm also going to stick with the original names just for clarity's sake. When I do these remakes in my head, I usually don't rename characters. Okay. But I think that's cool. Kudos on you for doing that. But that was I, a lot of thought. Yeah, that was a lot that's thought. way more thought than I wanted to put into this. <laughs> my, my movie's going to start way before the events of the original Highlander. And it's not going to take place in Egypt. I was going to start with Ramirez being Ramirez, and we were going to start the story in Egypt. I'm going to rename him, and I don't have a name for him yet. Sorry. Hmm. That... But he's going to be a Druid priest in England. This whole thing is going to start in England way before the events of Highlander, back in 1000 BC or whenever Ramirez was born in Egypt. And we're going to see just maybe 10 or 15 minutes of his story as an immortal then. We're then going to fast forward in time to the McLeod, the clan McLeod in Scotland, but it's not going to be a battle. Connor McLeod is just going to be a guy living with his wife, Heather, who he adores. And Ramirez, I'm going to call him Ramirez just for the sake of yeah, clarity, yeah. but that's not going to be his name, seeks him out to tell him what he is and prove to him what he is because we know the Kurgan is coming. At the same time, there's going to be like an alternate, they're going to be bouncing back and forth between storylines. The other storyline is going to be Kurgan's throughout history and his moving towards McLeod because he knows that this is where this fight is eventually going to go. I want this to be a historical thing from beginning to end. I don't want there to be a lot of time jumping because that freaked me out and pissed me off the first time I saw it. I want the immortals to affect history. I want to see the immortals as like historical figures as we're going through this movie. I would almost rather do it as like a trilogy almost, but I'm going to cram all this in mm-hmm. one movie. It's going to be a long – like figures that impact history, affect history. The Kurgan was Attila the Hun. Ah. Things that carry through history as legend are actually these immortals, and they affect our world by their influence over history. Like Adolf Hitler could be an immortal, okay. or the flip side, Winston Churchill maybe. That's how my story progresses through history, seeing how the immortals affect the entire planet. So we see our Ramirez character introduce himself to McLeod, who obviously does not believe for one second that he's immortal, so Ramirez just kills him. And he comes back to life. And he's like, see, told you. Now let's talk about what we need to do about this. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to see him die in battle like that. I think that was too public. And it, they would have hunted him forever if they thought he was really possessed by the devil. I didn't like that in the original story. So I'm just going to dispense with it. In a private moment, Ramirez is going to kill Connor and then prove to him that he's immortal when he comes back from an obviously fatal wound. And then they can discuss, all right, now you need to train because this is what's coming. Follow them throughout the ages. Some of my favorite parts of the original story are some of the little brief tidbits that we see of Connor's life, like the drunk duel in France. I think that was hilarious and I would love to keep that in. But just those snippets of time 
maybe fleshed out a little bit more, but to see how these two characters move through time towards that ultimate ending, which is not going to be New York. I think that's cliche. I was going to set mine in London just to keep it more in the European theater of mm-hmm. operations. I wanted to do the sacrifice thing too. She beat me to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in mine, um, Ramirez doesn't die earlier in the movie. They face the Kurgan together at the end. And because Connor still hasn't developed the strength to defeat the Kurgan, Ramirez tells him to take his head at that point. And then almost immediately following that, you get a very brief duel almost because Ramirez is so old and so powerful. He could have won, but chose not to. He wanted Connor to get the prize. So he had Connor take his head, which gives him the power to take the Kurgan's head. And that's how my, I almost, I I thought about going a different way to where the two of them fought the Kurgan together and won. And then they had to fight each other for the prize, but I didn't really want to go there. I think Mm -hmm. that would have been interesting to have, like the movie end with the two of them clashing swords over who's going to be the last one and then just cut to credits right there. But I talked myself into the sacrifice idea. But actually, either one of those could work. All right. So that's my pitch. I wanted it to be more of a historical piece than this time jumping thing that they did the first time. I think uh, you you two have a more close proximity to each other's ideas than mine's way out left field so (laughs) i like yours though because the samurai were definitely a sword culture and this really fits in with that i almost wish i had done that they they took elements of that for the third movie if you were crazy enough i did not watch after the second one i did not they actually i thought i'm i when you started talking about your idea i'm thinking has he seen the third one and is just plagiarizing that idea yes he goes to japan to study under a swordsmith in japan i didn't know that's how that movie starts well that's cool I guess the, they they're ahead of me. I stole it from him, obviously, <laughs> but I haven't seen the movie. I stole it without seeing the movie, so that's pretty amazing. Well, uh, let's see. So basically, we have to come to a middle. I would say since you two both have similar ideas, I would run close in vain to that. I, I kind of I like Scott's historical option, mm-hmm. and I and I like yours having a family connection. So. Maybe there's a way to, to blend those together where basically the backstory is told and they are historical elements, mm-hmm. but they they are related. And then maybe it's Connor hands it over to his sister at the end. That you know? could work. You know? mm-hmm. I like the idea. Uh, I like Angela's story. And I think that we could work like the historical aspects of mine into that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I wanted. So yeah. when you were saying that, 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 that's exactly what I wanted. Like they just skip over centuries of his life. And you're like, what the heck just happened? Um, and I do like your idea that immortals were important people throughout our times. So that's, that I thought that was kind of cool. I didn't even think about that. I, I do like London better than New York or Chicago. I do too. Yeah. I'm yeah. totally on board with London. And can, can we do it before modern day? Just so I don't have to sit there and go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why they're fighting with swords. <laughs> well, they have to be head. That's that- the only way they can die. So I'm like, Right. What other, I mean, uh, somebody can use an axe, I guess. Shotgun would do it. Here's my question. If everybody wants to kill themselves, do can they not just go and make sure somebody takes off their head or find a guillotine or? There are rules to this, like the whole holy ground thing. There, there are certain rules to this mythology. I don't know all of them. The holy ground, the mm-hmm. no fighting on holy ground is obviously a big one, but that implies that there are rules to this. Mm-hmm. In the TV show, which Angela, maybe you remember this, there was a storyline of a guy who, who was immortal and took it upon himself to – no, I'm sorry. He wasn't immortal, but he knew about them. Mm-hmm. So he took it upon himself to just end this whole thing. So he would find immortals and shoot them, and they die for like five minutes or whatever before they come back. And while they were dead, he would just take their heads off. Oh, mm-hmm. smart. So that was actually written into the series for a little bit. There was somebody who was like cheating, that they would shoot them, and then while they were unconscious or technically dead for a couple minutes, he'd just remove their heads. The the only thing I would have to end on is um, because I, I think we've already got an idea by connecting you two. But the bad guy is it going to be Hildy or is it going to be Kurgan? That's where you two get to duel it out. I I wanted it to be a female. I also have a really awesome casting choice. Um, but I <laughs> this but is I where you and I are going to fight. <laughs> because, well, ultimately because I wanted. I want to see two women fight at the end then. Cause if I'm going to make a female Highlander, like the story that we're going forward, which 
that's my favorite part is like the, the spin on that. Like you're like, oh, you follow Connor this whole time. So you're thinking this is Connor's movie. And then it's not, it gets, I mean, it is, but it gets handed on to Greer, which I thought was really cool. So that's why I liked the female. I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be. I just thought it would be cool to see a badass evil woman villain. So I can see that. But a big part of mine is the fact that the Kurgan used to be Attila the Hun. That was like, that Mm -hmm. was like a big part of my storyline. Like historical figures in the past are still with us. And that was the most evil person I could think of from that time period to go for the Kurgan. And I think in the trivia, they actually talk about the original storyline had the Kurgan fighting in Attila's army. That was where I got that idea from. Gotcha. So this is one where I'm going to put my foot down a little bit. And I really want the Kurgan to be a guy because I have a great casting choice. So I'm actually going to hit a cut there. And yeah. uh, Kurgan's a guy. Okay. Sorry. And we're going to go with my casting choice. Bazinga. Yep. Bazinga. <laughs> there you go. Angela's all like, Screw this show. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I ha- I was Roll telling my myself computer. on the way over here, I'm like, I'm saving my cut for the Kurgan because <laughs> he has to be in it the way I envision him. And when you hear my casting choice, you'll understand why. Well, that doesn't mean that your casting choice will go through. So we'll see where that ends up. Oh, no. I thought I got, <laughs> yeah. to, ch- I thought I got to choose where that goes. Mm, oh, get crap. To choose, choose the All character. Right, fine. Hey, she would have used it before. At for least I have a, problem, yeah, at so. least I have a chance. So, mm-hmm. all right. All right. Seems, seems legit. I think we got a movie. Yes. Everybody agrees. Is there anything more you want to flesh out? Uh, no, I think we've got a movie. I like the way hers ends. And mm-hmm. I like the fact that Connor has a sister that like follows him through history. I think that's kind of awesome. So I'm, so totally, be, I'm totally on board with that. Basically be the same scenario, except Kurgan. It's the Kurgan instead of Hildy. Right. And Angela cried. Right. Oh, <laughs> I did cry. And um, I also liked, and we're both in agreement, that Ramirez doesn't die. Because I'm like, that's such a waste to kill that character. It was. So I want Ramirez. Like I said, Ramirez shows up at the very end of this movie. So I want Ramirez to continue into the sequels. Okay. Yep. Sure. Sure. With Greer. Sounds good to me. I mean, he mm-hmm. continued in the sequels of the original, but it was such a stupid way that they brought him back that we definitely need to change that. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I got one last thing. So the big, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite parts of the whole movie was the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So I want a killer soundtrack and I want it to be done by like one band, just like Queen did it. So I was trying to think of a really cool, like synth pop kind of band. And funny enough, uh, the band I chose is Churches, which if you've never heard of them, you should. But they're a Scottish band. Oh, so I'm tying it all in. Sure. Sure. I don't know who they are, so I'll just give you that one. If you say it'll they're, work, they're, they're awesome. Work. And, okay. they, and I want them to do like their own co- – like I want them to do their own music, but I want them to do a cover of Who Wants to Live Forever. That song has to be in there because mm-hmm. that was just the best part of the soundtrack of that movie. Yep. Sounds good to me. All right. So who should direct the movie? I think we have a director in mind. We both have ideas, very strong ideas. and. Well, I based mine off of the sweeping epic of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So, of course, I want Peter Jackson to direct mine. That's probably not the best choice, but that's who I went with. <laughs> All right. Angela, who do you get? You know what? I totally can't even think of a director. I was so <laughs> caught up in my Connor, my Greer, my Hilder that I did not even think of a director. Um, you go, Aaron, and give me a second. I'll come up with one. Uh, I have James Wan is who I would want. James Wan. Who's James Wan? Who's James that? Wan is uh, – he did Furious 7. He did um, – He's done, he did Saw. He's done – trying to think of anything else you guys would know. Uh, so the, the 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 Conjuring, he's just he's just a very talented all around director, and he handled he handles sleek endings, building up an ending and then flipping it very well, which is what I was envisioning. So that's why I had James Wan. He does action okay. obviously with Furious Seven, and he's doing Aquaman next. Huh. Okay. So can Peter Jackson I'm... make it more than just walking around trying to get to the next sword fight? Because that'd be cool. Yeah, and that was kind of why I picked him because he does like battle scenes and sword fights really well. But he just needs to learn how to trim it down in between those. He'd make some cool sword fights, I think. Yeah. I think he could choreograph that really well. That was why that was why I went with that. I'm fine with that. Angela, if you're fine yeah. with Peter Jackson, I'll go with Peter Jackson. Yeah, I'm I'm cool with Peter Jackson. Cool. All right. So who do we who do we want to cast? And basically the way we have we have Connor, we have Greer, we have Ramirez, we have Kurgan. Any of those you can recast. So Scott won't stop with his idea for Kurgan. So why don't you just throw it out there and let's see who you got? There's only one person who's in Hollywood right now. That's who could probably do not this. true. No. Clancy Brown. 
Clancy Brown is old. I would love to see him do this, but we'd have to like computer youngerize him or however you say that. He can be an old immortal. Well, and that was the other thing. So the immortals are all kinds of like crazy different ages. So my theory, because I don't know if they ever address this, my this is how I kind of think of it. The first time they're killed, whatever age they are there, that's you're, where they stay. Oh, you're, I like that. You're channeling the TV show because that's exactly how that works. Okay. Okay. That's that's where I got it from. I'm like, yes, yeah. I like that. That's that. really cool. Whatever age you are when you die for the first time, that's where you're locked in. Man, that would be okay. awesome because as soon as I look the best I've ever looked, I'm like, now kill me, kill me, <laughs> lock me in. <laughs> Well, well you don't know you're an immortal until after you get killed, usually. Right. Which is just weird. Is, is it like a blood disease? <laughs> How do people get selected? They're aliens, remember? I You've know. seen the second one. I don't remember the second one. Oh, well, in the second one, they explain that is that they're aliens and they've been banished to Earth. I don't remember that it's at horrible. all. It's horrible. It's the worst thing they could have possibly done to the series. They tried to explain why the immortals are immortal, and they just took a great <laughs> idea and thrashed it. We don't need that, do we? No. Okay. Mm-mm. Just Eesh. They're immortal. Why are... Why is the sky blue? Yeah, you know, we don't they're, need they're to just, know They've everything. always been here, it's right? Just, sometimes things are cool. All right, so who's your casting choice? Your one can only be only, only one. Oh, it's got to be Jason Momoa. I mean, he would be perfect for that. Think about his character as Khal Drogo. In, I'm sold. Yeah. In yeah. Game of Thrones. Well, especially if you're sa- stating he's like Attila the Hun. Right. I, I can't think of anybody else anyways. Nope. Neither could I. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sold. All right, cool. I'm sold. No, I really wish we would have went with James Wan because he's already got a friendship with him. All right. So, anybody else have anybody for Connor or my Connor yeah. or Greer? Go ahead. You can go ahead and go first. Okay. So my Connor. <laughs> well, I want I want Scottish actors and <laughs> Scottish actresses cast in this damn movie because I want real accents. So mine's kind of cliche, but he's absolutely perfect. It's Sam Hoyne who stars in the show The Outlander. Oh, like he is yeah, the he's good. perfect, he's good. the perfect Highlander. He is ripped. He is Scottish. He is nice to look at <laughs> and he can sword fight. I mean, like that's all you need. So Sam Hoyne is my guy. I, I don't have a problem. I've actually, I think he's really good. I've seen Alan or Outlander. I had actually yeah. recast all three characters. So I'm going to throw an idea out there and let you okay. guys fight over it. Cause I don't really have a strong opinion about this. My strong opinion was about the Kurgan cause gotcha. he was my favorite character in the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to pronounce, I'm going to mispronounce this last name. Sam Claflin. The guy who played oh, okay. Finnick in uh, the Hunger Games movies. Yep, I know who's saying. Mm-hmm. I think he would be awesome in this. He was about the same age that Christopher Lambert was when they first filmed it. He can act really well. He's got the accent already down. Um, he can do action. Hunger Games was obviously action based. So that was just my thought. Yeah. I'll let you two do those two I'd out because I don't really care. I think they both would be good. I think Angela's pick is probably more just because. Well, I mean, Outlander, Highlander, they're they're even connected in that way. There you so. go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So it works out. Yeah, what, what about Wayne. Greer, Angela? Because you had uh... yeah. For my Greer, I actually um, chose because again, I want a Scottish actress. I chose Rose Leslie, who plays who played Egret on Game of Thrones, mm. because she is awesome. She can fight. She's fierce. She's Scottish. She's a ginger. What more do you want? <laughs> I would probably. I don't like Rose Leslie, so I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, you don't uh, like really? Rose Leslie? No, her, her character was the most annoying character in Game of Thrones for me. I did not really find her that enjoyable. I actually oh. really liked her. I'm hey, kind of on board with this two, choice. Two outrule me. So yeah, I'm go. on board with that. I agree with Woo-hoo. you. Fine. <laughs> and then I guess who, we've got Ramirez to cast. Yes. Hmm. That's. Does anybody have any ideas? Well, since I went with mine as a druid priest, I kind of went back to the Game of Thrones roots and picked Sean Bean. Because he's good at dying, too. <laughs> he's good at, <laughs> but, but he's not going to die. So no. Yeah, that, that'll we're be keep him alive. Yeah, we That's get to have thin. Sean Bean survive a movie. That would be awesome and unusual. That is hysterical. Yeah, Sean Bean leaving. Um, well, I was going – I was thinking Spaniard. So I, I chose uh, – going with Game of Thrones, Pedro Pascal. So Because mm. I thought he's charismatic as all get out. Give me a character. And- no, that's who I was going to – Pedro Pascal played Oberyn. Yes. I, that was mm-hmm. actually on my list if we had gone He's with – He's who I had yeah. picked, so it worked out I had considered me. that. That works. <laughs> that works. Okay. I'm on board with that. Sweet. Although, you know, my Japanese movie was going to have Daniel Wu and Chris Hemsworth, but whatever. <laughs> whatever. All right. Any nostalgic moments you guys want? These are like subtle or direct nods to the original or the remake or the series, whichever. The scene – Or the, the, the original or the sequels or the or the series. There was the scene where um, Connor shows Brenda that he's immortal, where she he sta- he puts her hand on the knife and then stabs himself with it. 
I kind of envisioned that as how my Ramirez would kill him. They'd be kind of in that moment to where people who had seen the original would recognize that Mm -hmm. stabbing motion. So you could do that as a nod to the original, but the scene that I wanted to keep in it somehow, which would be harder if we didn't set this in modern times for the final Mm -hmm. battle, that absolutely crazy vigilante Marine (laughs) who goes running down the alley and then shoots the Kurgan when he's fighting Cassidy at the end. Oh, yeah. That was so ridiculous and so funny in the post-Vietnam era that there's this guy running around with an Uzi looking to machine gun criminals. I would love to figure out a way to keep something like that in the movie as a nod to that scene. I'm because sure you could. I thought that I just laughed so hard the other day when I watched this about how ridiculous that was. I I love that scene. <laughs> All right. Uh, I really want to see, if, especially since you have Jason Momoa in it, I want him to cut a table in half. Because yes. I think if anybody's yeah. going to have the kind of energy that Clancy Brown did, uh, Jason Momoa will, will bring it. And I also want, at some point, Jason Momoa, as a Kurgan, to say, do as I say, woman. I, yes. Because it makes me laugh. You know who actually said it in the original, though? Huh. Connor. I don't care. I want. He was talking to his <laughs> wife that way. I know. I want, I want him to say it. Because I think Jason Momoa will make it cool again. He'll bring it back to where you can be misogynistic. Mm. But not really. It's kind of cool. I dig it because eventually that Greer works. is going to kill him. So. <laughs> that works. You hope. She'll get her revenge. The only thing is I, I would like, it, not necessarily like a scene, but I still want, obviously, the death of the immortals to have to be done by beheading. Like, I think that's got to stay. Yep. Yep. I still wanted, obviously, it to be center around uh, the McClouds. I want the scene, which I wrote in mind, where McLeod keeps trying to kill himself until you realize, like, he's he can't. And then if I'm going to do for a, go for a cheesy scene like you guys are kind of adding, <laughs> I totally want the scene in the original where Ramirez and Connor are like running on the beach together when they're training. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. And then like cutting to them like on the cliffs fighting and everything. That part just cracked me up. So that part I'd be was cool if we did cool. some cheesy trading scene. So nobody, nobody's for the Skinamax nipple scene? No, we can leave nope. that. I don't know. I think you guys are missing an opportunity here. I'm going to go in a more sentimental direction, though. Connor's devotion to his wife, Heather, like throughout the centuries, he never remarries. He's always lighting a candle for her on her birthday. I love that from the original movie. I would want to keep that in there. You can do it for his family, right? Yeah. That's sweet. I, I don't care about all that. But if you want <laughs> I just it, thought fine. it was nice. Yeah. That's nice. I say move on, Connor, really. <laughs> like, how long has it been? I mean, you're immortal. I, I assume you're going to have a few wives. Let's Let's get this done. One per century, right? Sure. <laughs> no. That's why I like in that my version, he ends up, he finally it found a woman he loves and he's finally married. And that's why it's like it it was easier for him to make the sacrifice to kill himself because he's, you know, he's just done. Like his his love of his life is gone. He's lived long enough. He's like, I'm done. So. Oh, well, get over yourself, man. Let's go. No, it's sad. You, got, you got your sister. Yeah, it's sad. Blah, 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 blah. You were going to live forever. I, She's going to die eventually. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> no, I totally also pictured his wife being played like Zoe Saldana. Mm, I don't think it's Saldana. I think it's Saldana. No, Saldana. But you could throw an eye in That's there. a good choice, though. She's yeah, a great actress. Saldana. I like her. She is. That's not lasagna. It's Saldana. Saldana. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Close enough. Whatever, Lambert. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. You got you there. All right. Well, we got before we move on, we got one more clip from the original Highlander. Who is the Kurgan? And where does he come from? Well, the Kurgans were an ancient people from the steppes of Russia. The Kurgan. He is the strongest of all the immortals. He is the perfect warrior. With heart, faith, steel. In the end, there can be only one. Okay, now it's time for a final pitch. This is where we, this is where Wayne Henderson himself from MediaVoiceOvers.com offers a whole version of what we just rambled through and try to make sense out of all that. So thank you, Wayne, and take it away. Throughout history, immortals have roamed the lands. Unkillable men and women of mystery, these warriors have conquered and dominated history. The Kurgan, you may know him as Attila the Hun, is the most brutal of them all, and he is determined to wipe out all of his kind. Connor McLeod has had his life destroyed by the Kurgan, his family murdered, 
Connor fights past fatal wounds when he finds himself immune to death. A Spaniard arrives and teaches Connor the truth of his destiny. As an immortal, Connor cannot be killed except by decapitation. Each immortal gains the other's strength by their death. As the Kurgan challenges Connor to a final battle where he fully reigns to his end, Connor learns his sister Greer is alive. Together, they vow to annihilate this menace, together as family. Will they succeed? Who can wield the power of the quickening? Can they defeat the fiercest immortal? Find out next summer as the ultimate competition finally comes to a head. A game where there can only be one winner. Highlander. Awesome. Great job. Great job, Wayne. Great job. And I hope uh, everybody picks up on that movie and makes it because I don't want to see the actual movie be remade because like it was, because that would be not good. Agreed. <laughs> not good. All right. Well, as we wrap this up, I want to make sure I mentioned one more time, Wayne Henderson, courtesy of MediaVoiceOvers.com. You can find his other work, Package Fan Podcast. He does a show for Castle Rock, which is coming out on Hulu. He does a bunch of stuff. So be sure to find Wayne Henderson. Anything you guys want to mention before we get out of here? They can find you on social media or anything else? No, I hide. So okay, fair enough. No. You can find me here on the Hollywood Outsider, usually. There you somewhere. Go. <laughs> yeah, pretty much the same. Okay. I also um I wanted to say there can be only one Wayne Henderson. <laughs> nice. Very there you well. go. Well yeah. played. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, you can find me on this podcast and The Hollywood Outsider and Smirk and too many other ones to go through. Subscribe and review us via Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, or your podcast app of choice. You can email us at remakethismoviewrite at gmail.com if you have any thoughts on this episode or go into the Facebook group and just put your comments there. We're also on Twitter at Remake Right. Thanks, guys, for being here for this. Thanks for having me. I love yeah, this. Is my first you. time doing this show. I loved it. It was fun. It's fun, Angela. This is well. This is both of your probably last time because this is probably the last run of the show we're going to do ever. Boo. Boo. <laughs> this was yeah. one that was is a good choice by the listeners. This one definitely needed a remake, and I think we did a great job with it. Mm-hmm. Hey, Angela, have you ever seen Flash Gordon? I have seen Flash Gordon. That was the other one that people. That was like oh, number man. two. That one is screaming for a remake. That's a horrible movie. <laughs> yeah, that one was so bad where I saw that and I said, I'll pass. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of work. We'd have yeah. to make a whole movie. Thank now. God it didn't win because I <laughs> probably would have passed. I really hate that movie. Brian Williams, uh, who's been, it was on the V episode, still to this day tells me I'm wrong. That movie is fantastic. And I'm like, it's never been fantastic, man. Great soundtrack. No. Bad movie. Brian's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's a horrible movie. Yeah. That's yeah. like up there in one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> All right, well, the credits rolled on this remake, but be sure to come back for our next one. Remember that every film you love will get a reboot someday, and only you can remake this movie right. Right.